there's a total amnesia in the United States about where we came from. Even among workers, they don't know how hard it was to get the unions organized. For example, the auto workers now are automatically organized. They don't know that, that their president, Walter Ruther, was almost killed, that his brother was almost killed, that there were all sorts of sluggings and, and that Henry Ford said he would close his factories before he would ever deal with the union, etc., etc. All that history is kind of forgotten. The head of the National Association of Manufacturers says it is generally assumed that the Roman Catholic Church of the United States is and always has been unalterable in its antagonism to all forms of socialism. It's our belief a careful reading of this pamphlet will lead you to the conclusion we have reached, namely, that it involves what may prove to be a covert effort to disseminate partisan pro-labor union socialistic propaganda under the official insignia of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, dear. the excitement that is attached to the 1919-1920 document is that it was the first cohesive statement of the church on in ex expressing in some detail what Catholic views were on social issues and it called for minimum wage legislation a minimum working age for children it called for uh, recognition of the right of labor to organize it called for so a whole social insurance scheme the establishment of unemployment insurance and work compensation and and old age sickness and so forth sickness insurance um, it talked about it talked about uh, the, the country having a plan for continually raising the level of income of its people. Uh, it was a very far-sighted document for its time, and indeed, to look back on it now is to see its fulfillment in the 1930s in the social program of the New Deal. John Ryan was a, a priest out of Minnesota who came to uh, be educated in Washington at the beginning of the 20th century at a time when the progressive movement was just getting underway. And most Catholics were not part of that reform movement. They were industrial workers and were in the factories. And there weren't many of those middle class reformers of the types that joined Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson in their crusades. Um, Ryan was a little unusual because he grew up in a family, an Irish family, where they read a lot of Irish radical newspapers and particularly the land question was much debated. He was a neighbor, his family were neighbors of Ignatius Donnelly, great populist orator in the Midwest. And he also was a great admirer of John Ireland, the Archbishop of St. Paul, who was a great citizen who had been the chaplain of the Grand Army of the Republic and was widely admired by all Americans in the late 19th century. So Ryan came to postgraduate work after being ordained at the Catholic University in Washington, open to the idea of a kind of public leadership. And he, uh, he, read, the, he had read the uh, papal encyclical Rerum Novarum published in 1891 and combined with all these other features in the 90s, decided he would devote his life to what he called the social gospel, a term that was most used in those days with Protestants. The first real national labor union, which was short-lived when all was said and done, was the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor followed a Masonic ritual, first of all, and used that type of structure with secret handshakes and so forth and so on. And part of it was to keep their doing secret from the employer. Well, in the 1880s, Terence Powderly became the Grand Master Workman. And he was also mayor of Scranton and a Catholic. And it got tied up then with uh, some popular socialistic theories, especially of a man in um, New York named Henry George. 
He ran for mayor of New York in 1886 with the support of Terence Powderly and the Knights of Labor. In the fall of 1886, while this controversy was brewing in New York, the archbishops of the country, who had the right to pass on the toleration of these secret societies, voted on the Knights of Labor, but two archbishops voted for a condemnation, that this was a condemned secret society. It was the Archbishop of Santa Fe and the Archbishop of St. Louis. In both of those cities, there had been railroad strikes, violent ones. Nevertheless, Archbishop Gibbons of Baltimore, who had just been named a cardinal, went to Rome and he defended the Knights of Labor. He argued, among other things, that this, after all, was a movement of labor people against unbridled capitalism. In the fall of 1887, Rome approved the Knights of Labor, provided that they changed their constitutions to remove any issue of these secret societies was they took an oath never to reveal uh, their activities to any authority in church or state. You had these clauses in their constitution. Terence Powderly changed them to conform with church teaching. So Catholic membership was then permitted. As a result of Cardinal Gibbons's defense of the Knights of Labor and his asking the Holy See, the Pope, not to condemn the writings of Henry George, but to write an encyclical on the mutual rights of capital and labor. In 1891, Pope Leo XIII issued his first social encyclical, the first Catholic social encyclical, Rerum Novarum. John Ryan, who would become prominent at the Catholic University of America later on, was a student at the St. Paul Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. In 1893, when he said he had never had heard the encyclical taught in a course, but he read it on his own, and this revolutionized his life. So he did a doctoral dissertation trying to translate Pope Leo XIII's teaching that all workers had a right and justice to a living wage into concrete uh, goals and means in the United States. How much would a living wage be in 1906 when he published it? He came up with some dollar figures, north and south. And how would you get it? And he examined, well, could you get it through union organization? Unions were pretty weak. Could you get it through exhortation and urging employers to do it? Well, no, because if the good employer paid the living wage and the bad employer didn't, the good employer would be put out of business. So he concluded that you could only get a living wage through legislation, minimum wage laws. And when his book on that subject was published, he became a kind of national authority on minimum wage laws and the Catholic priest who was in engaged in the progressive movement. So by 1910, every progressive organization he seems to have joined, and they'd have him as the Catholic on their masthead and letterhead. In 1919, when the bishops decided to organize nationally to have a presence in Washington and on the national scene, Ryan was made the head of their social action department and authored a document the bishops published, which was a program of social reconstruction pointing towards desirable social reforms after World War I. It was kind of a blueprint for the later New Deal, minimum wage laws, support for the right of labor to organize, social welfare legislation of the social security type, uh, insurance against accidents, sickness, unemployment, and old age, uh, that kind of thing that comes later in the New Deal. So he had written that for the bishops. And then he, from then until his death in 45, he was kind of the bishop's advisor. Um, he was a very strong supporter of Franklin Roosevelt to the degree that Father Coughlin, who had initially supported Roosevelt and then opposed him, the great radio orator of uh, the 30s, called uh, Ryan disdainfully the right reverend New Dealer. Yes, well, Ryan spoke for the bishops to some extent. The National Catholic Welfare Conference was a voluntary organization, unlike the uh, present National Conference of Catholic Bishops, which is a canonically established uh, organization to which all bishops must belong. The old National Catholic Welfare Conference was, was a purely voluntary organization, and some bishops didn't like it, didn't agree with it at all, didn't agree with Ryan at all. His worst fight, I suppose, was with uh, Cardinal O'Connell of Boston, over the issue of the child labor amendment. Rand was a strong proponent of the child labor amendment. Um, O'Connell and some of the other bishops were very much opposed to it on the grounds that this would interfere with the freedom of the family, etc. Uh, same sounds like ancient history today. But um, O'Connell took it very seriously, and I, 
it's my impression, although I'd have to go back and check the record, that, that Ryan was not permitted to speak in Boston for some time after that fight. Others would have disagreed with him on, um, not so much on the pastoral letter of 1919, but on some of his other activities. For example, he supported the, um, the packing of the court under Roosevelt. Well, obviously, not all the bishops agreed with that. In the 1930s, especially during the New Deal, with the election of FDR, there was a gradual union between Catholic social thought and some of the New Deal legislation. There was not direct influence, but what FDR started carrying out and what John Ryan in particular was proposing seemed to coincide. We didn't have a federal law guaranteeing the right to organize until 1935 uh, with the uh, National Labor Relations Act. Before that, it was um, every man for himself. They had, to, they had to go on strike if necessary to get the right to organize. But he, his interest was in uh, guaranteeing these, uh, these basic rights under law. So when the National Labor Relations Act was, was passed in 1935, some 16 years after the bishop's statement, he hailed it as one of the most important pieces of legislation ever adopted by the federal government. One of the things that made him distinct in those years was that in the 30s and earlier, but especially in the 30s, many priests and Catholics gave strong support to trade unions as the, the way to achieve social justice and to improve the lot of Catholic workers. Ryan always supported trade unionism in principle, but he came to believe that the state, that the government was the indispensable instrument to the attainment of social justice, that without the strength of the government, that American corporate power was such that it would always override efforts to create a more just or more equitable social order, so that Roosevelt's effort to create a state that would take responsibility for some minimum levels of welfare and would use its regulatory authority to discipline business was to him absolutely necessary if justice was to be achieved. And in his later years, after the war started, he died in 1945, he became even more convinced of that. And uh, he was very fearful that after the war, kind of corporate power would return and dominate the country. And that labor unions, good as they were, would never be strong enough to stand up to that power without the support of a democratic state responsive to the real interests and will of the majority of the people. Um, but Ryan was uh, the great theorist of Catholic social uh, teaching in the United States, the man who translated the papal encyclicals. And he stands in a tradition, he's followed by George Higgins and today by Father Brian Hare, that tradition that has oriented the bishops towards strong support for basic social welfare and social justice legislation. My uh, time marker is the Vietnam War. About the time of the Vietnam War, many of labor's supporters in church groups, Protestant as well as Catholic, turned their attention to other matters, either to the war issue, which was obviously a major issue, or to the inner city problems, or to the question of civil rights. And they began to think that the labor movement, the labor problem was passe. Uh, by, by that time, uh, the workers in the major industries were organized, and it looked as though they were no longer on the cutting edge. Uh, I would say, therefore, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, the, the involvement of church-related groups in the labor field is much, much lower than it was in the 30s and 40s. Uh, however, there is some comeback. The law has now created enormous hurdles, hurdles that John Ryan never dreamed of when he talked about protecting the right of labor to organize and the right of workers to join unions. He never dreamed that there would be a whole industry of, of so-called labor management consultants who, who team together to thwart the desire of workers to have unions and who write programs for employers as to how you can oppose the union and how you can fire somebody and thereby terrorize the rest so they won't join the union. I remember seeing one issue of a conservative magazine in which there was an editorial praising solidarity to the skies. And then in the back of the magazine, there was an advertisement in the regular advertising columns for a management consulting firm which announced in the ad that its purpose was to help its clients to break unions. 
So I thought, well, there, here's, the, here's the, uh, the dichotomy, the irony of it. The editorial is talking about the necessity of unions in Poland, the importance of freedom of trade unions in Poland, and here in the back they're taking money from a, a management consulting firm, of which there are many, which made no bones about it, just said explicitly in the ad, if you want to get rid of a union in your firm or if you want to keep a union out, come to us, we'll show you how to do it. So it's a, it's a strange contradiction in our psychology in the United States. But it was very common. Now a quarter of a million men are back on the job to create the latest... Labor was surely a major force, not the only force, but a major force in bringing about what we now call the middle class. And that's precisely one of the reasons that the middle class is declining today, because the labor movement is declining. By middle class, I'm speaking of people in the auto industry, for example, who um, on, once the unions came in were able to earn enough that they could buy their own home, they could send their kids to school, to college, which was not true before. Uh, they could buy a car, they could go on vacations. What we generally speak of as a middle-class style of life. For most people in the United States, most workers, that didn't exist until the labor movement took on real strength. It surely didn't exist at all in, in the industries like the auto industry and the steel industry. And today, from all accounts, from everything I can read, what we call the middle class is in rapid decline because the, the wages that people are earning in the non-union jobs are not sufficient to keep up anything like a middle-class standard of life. For example, if you lose your job in the steel industry and you, you go to work um, in the service trades, maybe working in a restaurant or whatever, in the steel industry you were probably earning, I don't know, $17, $18 an hour, plus health insurance, plus benefits. You might be earning $6 an hour, $7 an hour in, in the other job. So that when, when we say that millions of new jobs were created in the last um, few decades, you have to look at those figures very carefully to see how many of them were, were just McDonald's jobs, how many of them were service trade jobs which, which barely paid a living wage or, or a minimum wage, or how many of them were, were jobs that could keep people at a middle class standard. And that's why the, I emphasized earlier the problem of women workers. The large majority of women workers are in these jobs that pay less than a, 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 a trade union wage, and therefore it, it takes, in almost all cases, it takes two wage earners to, um, to keep the family afloat. And uh, I'm, I'm all, I'm impressed, of course, by any politician who speaks about family values, as they all tend to do during a campaign, but I'd be more impressed if they do something to, uh, to relieve the economic pressures on people, which forces people to, um, to have two jobs in the family, whether they want to or not. If women want to work, that's fine. But to force people to have two jobs to keep up an ordinary standard of living, it seems to me, tells us something about our economy. Health insurance it seems to me is the number one crisis because uh, it impacts on so many people. The estimates are, what, 40 million without any kind of health insurance. I've been through a lot of health problems in the last year, so I'm very conscious of what this must mean to people. I'm covered by insurance, but if I were not, it would be astronomical cost for the kind of surgery and other treatments that I've had in the last year or two. How people are surviving, I do not know. <clears throat> for the first time in my lifetime, people are beginning to talk rather sensibly about health insurance instead of ideologically. It used to be that any mention of national health care of whatever kind was dismissed immediately as socialized medicine. It became a, an ideological um, uh, game, capitalism versus socialism, free market versus socialism. Most of the major industries today want some kind of national health care. They can't afford to go on the way they're doing now. But what, what I think what will drive us to labor management cooperation is the crisis. Um, there's something very critically wrong when the United States can't compete with Japan and even Korea now in selling automobiles. Now, what, what do they do about it? 
they better get together jointly and figure out if is there anything that we can do together that, that we're not doing now uh, or else we're both going to be in the soup. No, I don't know anybody in the labor movement who believes that you can have that relationship without the employer having a profit, at least in profit-making institutions or institutions that are intended to be that way. Uh, I think that every trade unionist I know understands that we need to have a profitable employer so that the next time around we can negotiate to get some of that profit for our people, to get our share of it. Uh, but there's no concept of you know, destroying the employer. But unfortunately, there is the concept in the employer of preventing the union from existing. And that's the tragic imbalance in our, our relationships. I happen to think that represents a terrible national deficit and a terrible problem for the nation to deal with. It's a problem for us in our everyday lives, but it's a problem for the nation. We are losing. We worry about our competitiveness and we worry about productivity. We're losing billions of dollars by by not taking the easiest route to to allow the fulfillment of people, the flowering of people, the development of productive uh, relationships, which result in the enhancement of productivity and benefits to both sides. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's uh, hard to make that logic come through to everyone. Not everyone accepts that logic. There are still lots of employers who believe the most effective workplace is the one in which he's in charge and he has absolute control. Uh, there are studies uh, by the pound that tell you the opposite is true, <laughs> that tell you that you need a cooperative workplace for people to be truly productive. One bishop in the Midwest announced recently that he would never deal with a union in his schools. Well, uh, he's going to have trouble. If those workers want to organize, the only way they can organize is to go on strike. And he may wake up someday and find out that that's what they've done. But it seemed to me a bit of foolhardy thing to do, to say, I just won't deal with the union. Um, you have another, a number of other cases where they are dealing with unions very, very constructively. It varies all over the lot. The official position, uh, when you speak of the church, uh, there is no one entity, the church, it's, it's many people, but the official position is very clear. In the pastoral on the economy of 1986, the bishops say that, that all of the principles cited in this document, which apply to others, apply to our own institutions, of course, and that if anything, the church must be set the example. I went back yesterday for another reason and looked up the wording of the 1971 Senate of Bishops, uh, which included a section on justice within the church. Same thing, saying we, whoever wants to speak of justice to others must be, be just himself and must be seen as being just. With them, it was a question of our credibility. I'm very much concerned uh, from the credibility side because I, I get um, numerous complaints from people who say, well, you people are talking out of both sides of your mouth. You know, you, you, you tell uh, 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 growers out in California that they, they have an obligation to recognize the right of farm workers to organize, but then down the street you got a Catholic hospital which do just the opposite. I have frequently made an appeal, it hasn't made me very popular I must say, to women's religious groups saying here's a great opportunity for women religious seems to me to take the leadership because the crooks of the problem is hospitals. That's where the majority of the workers are. Uh, schools are a much smaller problem. If you have a hospital of a thousand beds, as we do in some cases, you're talking about four or five thousand workers. That's a lot of people under one roof. It seems to me that would be a glorious uh, tribute to the Catholic hospital system if people would go around saying we're setting the we're setting the pace here. We're, we're giving you an example of how, uh, in an innovative way, to develop labor management cooperation for the good not only of the workers and of the hospital, but for the good of the community. That, it seems to me, is what the bishops were driving at in their pastoral when they, when they said in the section on the church as an employer that we must set an example not only by recognizing the rights of our workers, but by being an imaginative and innovative uh, setting an example for the rest of industry. Years ago, a worker joined a union because he thought, I'm going to be here for 30 years, I better make this a good job. 
Now, the younger workers particularly tend to think, well, if this one doesn't work out, I'll go someplace else. So there's that kind of change of attitudes. I suspect that plays into the, the uh, future of the church as well. And I think if there is a, uh, a difference for the future, it is that the church has to talk about that need for individual dignity, the need for individual action, individual responsibility, but also to talk about the logic of common action. But we have a much longer tradition in the United States, it goes back almost to the very beginning, of a highly individualistic culture, which almost on philosophical grounds opposed unions. We have the most violent record of any major country in, in the opposition unions back uh, before, before the 30s and the 40s with the use of goons, the use of, of detectives to break unions, etc., etc. Uh, that is, we have a much longer tradition of violent opposition to unions than any other major country that I know of. Um, and deep within our culture, in contrast to, um, uh, to Canada, for example, you have this almost philosophical notion of American individualism, that uh, you don't need organizations. That people, people can get along on their own. But surely, uh, uh, any, any organization as big as the trade union movement has made a lot of mistakes. But I think we have to distinguish between the mistakes and what is really fueling the opposition to unions. But everybody who works wants to produce a quality product. They want to look at the end of the day at what they've done and say, that's pretty nice. They want some recognition for that. They want their dignity recognized. They want to be treated decently. And they want to be rewarded for their work. And they want to be able to support a family. Uh, what's different in the, in the modern uh, world, that is, if you look, the difference of 70 years uh, since John Ryan's uh, authorship of the letter, uh, people have much more desire now to balance work and leisure. Uh, they didn't think as uh, 70 years ago as much about leisure time which means they weren't able to think as much about being with a family, about, about participating in the lives of their kids or the life of their community. And in the modern world, people don't have to work 60 and 70 hours a week to earn a living. They hope to do that in 40 hours, and they want to balance off some leisure interests, some family interests. So that's another piece of what's changed, I think, for the unions and for workers. I think that God worries about the fair treatment of workers and wants to see that brought about and wants to see people's dignity recognized in the workplace. I don't think uh, my God is only worried about all of us earning our way to heaven. I see a God and a church that uh, wants people to be able to have the fullest possible life and the, the fullness of that life, to have happiness, to have happy children and care for them well and be able to care for them well. Uh, and to, to grow and, and enjoy life. So I have perspective of a church that absolute of every church, that it has a real responsibility to be involved in the everyday lives of its people and in their social and economic and community problems.